and we are live on the gamification revolution. Hi everybody, I'm your host Gabe Zickerman and I'm coming to you from a eh, pretty nice starting to feel like fall day in New York City and my guest today is the one and only Yu Kai Chow coming to us from Fremont, California. Hi Yu Kai. Hello, how are you doing? Oh, so good. And all of you who are with us live, thank you so much for being here like you are every week. Uh, it's great to have you. You'll need to log in before you can chat. And chat, you'll want to. Join us in this spirit of discussion that's happening uh, in the right call. Make sure you log in with Facebook or Twitter. Click the buttons uh, to get the information that you need. Uh, and then you can actually ask us questions. You can ask me a question. You can ask Yukai a question. Just click on one of those buttons. If you've got a camera, we'll bring you live on online. If you're watching us, at a later time, uh, either on video or listening to us on a podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, but of course, you can't ask questions. You can follow us online. And for those of you that haven't already heard, I'm about to embark, in fact, tomorrow on the great gamification world tour, G Summit Global. It starts now. It's gsummit.com, traveling all around the world, doing live workshops. We're paired with online video lectures from some of the top experts in gamification and live, special live Q&A. You can join us online. You can join us live for a hands-on workshop and earn your certification. You can join us live for a meetup all around the world over the next two months. I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you. It's gsummit.com to sign up to get more information. Okay. Great, so let's get into it. Yukai, here's a question for you. What do you think, based on, on kind of your experience and your knowledge, what do you think is the most challenging thing for somebody who wants to become a gamification designer? What's the hardest thing for that that they need to understand to be able to be good at that work? I think, and, and this ties back to my Octalysis framework, right? It's I think the biggest thing is I think everyone who, or not everyone, a lot of people who focus, who want to go into gamification, really are too obsessed with the game mechanics and game elements when they in fact should focus on how people feel. Because if you think about it, every single game out there has game elements in them, right? But most games are not successful. Most games are boring. They're losers in terms of financially. Um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of an odd thinking to think, hey, if I just take these game mechanics from a lot of failed games and put it in my product, it'll be automatically be successful. So I think the key thing is, first of all, put the game mechanics, game elements on the side and think about how do these games make people feel? Do they make them feel inspired, accomplished, even scared for horror games? And how can I utilize uh, the game elements to accomplish those feelings? So it's so the, the game mechanics are a means to an end, not an end in itself. That's that's the the, the one big advice I give people. I, well, I think that's really interesting advice. Right? So how do we how do we drive people's feelings? How do we create feelings in people? Well, first of all, you understand the feelings, right? So so what I do in my framework is I break it down to eight core drives, such as epic media and calling development, accomplishment, empowerment, and creative feedback, which are the white hat gamification techniques. But there's also the, the, the bottom ones, which are black hat, like scarcity and impatience. You want something just because you can't have it. Like games, there's like energy. You run out of energy, you have to wait for another hour, right? Or unpredictability, curiosity, like gambling. So you want to, you first want to understand what are those core drives, and then you, then you learn from games. You, you see in games, oh, what are the things that games do that bring out those core drives? Like a collection set, right? You have three out of the five parts, and now you're obsessed and trying to find the other two, you would spend money to get the other two, even though those are the parts, parts of a price, right? So you first understand the core drive, then you look into games, see what they do to accomplish that, and then as a final step, you, you figure out how to transfer those game elements and techniques into what you're doing. What? Well, so I just, Adam, I want to talk about the octalysis more. You just, you crammed a lot of information there, <laughs> in there, Yukai, for folks that, that don't know you. And Sasha just put up a link to your website, and we're also going to put up the link directly to the octalysis framework so folks can take a look at it. And I want to dig into it a little bit more. I just want to uh, jump back for one second. Uh, and you talked about, like, this drive to collect, which you just brought up. Yep. Um, people want to collect or complete sets. Does everybody want to do that? And how do we know if somebody wants to do that or not until we actually uh, expose them to it? and then see their reaction. So I think everyone is somewhat exposed to any or all of the eight core drives. It's just a degree of difference. Like some people are obsessed with collection. Some people are just kindly interested in collecting. Usually, you know, what the interesting thing about a collection set um, is that at the beginning, you might not care about it. And, you know, companies might just start giving to you and like, oh, whatever. But when you get to some trigger point, a critical mass, usually like over 60%, then you automatically want to complete it. It's just kind of awkward to have the majority of a collection without completing it. So I think most people, if they have nine out of nine out of ten pieces of a collection set, they if it's easy for them, depending on how much they want it, if it's easy that they always want to go and at least 
you know, complete the set. I, I think everyone uh, has that tendency. It's just some people okay. do it more, some people do, do you, it less. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a kind of like, uh, so then do you think that the, these things, things like collecting are things we can expect kind of everybody to want to do? Because my impression is, I tend to agree with you, like if, uh, if we had 100 people and they had mm -hmm. 9 out of 10 things, mm -hmm. the vast majority of people would probably want to create it. But, you know, to your point about not wanting to be overly focused on the game mechanics, I guess my question for you is, like, how do we even know that the things in the Octalysis are universal? Why do we yeah, think that? Yeah, so, so, uh, and, and I want to talk more about it. How so the premise that? of Octalysis, it's never a cookie cutter solution. You can't just say, hey, I'm, I'm working on a game occasion project and collection sets are always great, let me put it in. It's more about looking at through the framework, understanding, hey, understanding who are my users, what motivates them, or what's the context, or what is my app doing, what is my product doing, and then figure out if collection is appropriate. And even if you decide collection set is appropriate, there's still a, a con context in how you implement, right? Uh, you, like in all these game mechanics and elements, you can, you can put something in and it can either be very motivating or it can insult the people. Like, oh, like, what do you, like people would say, what am I, a three-year-old kid? Right? So you really want to understand who are you appealing to. And, and it's, it's a framework to help you think through a design, not to blindly like, take things out and put, put, put things in. So, so Sasha actually asked this very interesting question about collection. You know, he actually said here in the chat, um, and thanks for this, Sasha. Nice to see you again. Um, he said it's more important to find out how to get people to start collecting rather than how to finish that nine out of ten. So, okay. Uh, would you agree with that? Do you think yeah. That that's yeah. Fair? So, so this is this is why you know I I talk, the eight core drives need to work together because usually. The, you know, I break down uh, a gamer's experience phase to four of them, the discovery, onboarding, scaffolding, end game. Usually people don't care about the collection set until the end game or towards the later stage of the scaffolding phase. So at the beginning, you need to make sure you appeal to their other core drives to make them move forward to the next phase, right? And this onboarding stage is always about development culture. You want them to feel smart and curious and, you know, whatnot. And so at this point, you start to give them these collection set and they don't care yet. But as they go into the end game, they've done everything. There's no more leveling up. Maybe you know, there's they've done everything once. But it's they they have you know, it's a ton of work to finish the uh, collections, and that's when you see uh, games that last over you know eight years, ten years, like Diablo, right? People just grind every day for ten years um, because they want to complete their set, they want to perfect their gear. So that's something I study a lot too. You know, it's like most games last three to eight months and people switch. But there's some games that design for the end game really well, StarCraft, Diablo, you know, modern games, or tra traditional games like chess, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> that really focus on yeah. your core drives in the end game. <clears throat> so, okay, so very interesting. And, you know, actually, it, one of the interesting things that I've found in, uh, you know, in doing my work over the years on gamification, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that's been very tough for people is putting things into frameworks, coming up with frameworks and contexts uh, to make sure that folks have uh, the right way of parsing. There's so much data mm -hmm. and so much information. Um, and, you know, in fact, in the last book, Gamification Revolution, we included a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of interesting kind of frameworks for thinking about how to parse different kind of gamification examples, you know, based on their type. So tell back up for us for one second. Tell us uh, how you arrived at Octalysis, and then we're going to talk about what it is and, and try to understand it in more in a slower paced detail. Okay, so this is a, this is not technical, so this is an easy story, right? So let me start a bit about how I started in in working gamification, and then how I came up with Octalysis. Yeah, so, sure. so before two thousand and three, I was a very heavy gamer. I made sure that whatever I played, I was hardcore. I you know I studied strategy. I had to be the best at it. And then in two thousand and three, that's when I quit. Diablo 2, um, and I felt really empty. You know, I feel like just a big chunk of my life, literally thousands and thousands of hours of my time has been lost. And I thought, hey, it wouldn't be so awesome if I spent all those thousands of hours, you know, learning a new language or playing the violin. You know, I'd level up in real life. You know, that'd be so much more meaningful. So then I became obsessed with um, two things. One is making games more productive, and two is making life more uh, more fun. <clears throat> and um, and so I started. So I started. You know, working in, in quote unquote gamification wasn't called that. I had a lame name for it. Um, and then I started my first few startups in gamification. Then I would get a lot of consulting or advisory stuff coming and I would shoot things like, hey, you can do this, do, 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 do. And then, and then people ask me, hey, you got, how did you come up with this? Right? I'm like, I don't know. I guess you just have to play a lot of games. Um, but then I really wanted to figure out how to scale this knowledge. Right? I wanted to 
well, I want other people to be able to figure this out, especially when gamification became more of a big buzzword you know, a few years back. I realized, hey, there's a lot of tremendous value in gamification. It's great because people care about my lonely passion now. But the, the issue is there's so many misconceptions in it. I wanted the world to apply better gamification. So that's when I started doing a deep examination of, okay, what, how do I come up with these things? Uh, and so that's where I slowly produced uh, Octalysis and, and so forth. And then it just kind of caught on. It's been uh, taught throughout the world in many companies and universities now. So, Okay, so, so what is it? What is Octalysis? <laughs> Octalysis is a framework to help anyone create better gamification design. So the first step of Octalysis is it breaks down uh, uh, motivation to eight core drives, like I said, you know, epic meaning and calling, you know, social influence and relatedness, whatnot. And it's arranged in an octagon shape um, for, for a few reasons. One, it's, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some tendencies. On the left one, the left side, those are the left brain core drive. So things that deal with logic, calculations, ownership. And the ones on the right are the ones that are the right brains, which deal with social, creativity, you know, unpredictability, and the like. The ones on the top, which this is a fascinating to me these days, is, are the more positive ones. So I call them white hat gamification techniques. So things that oh good, there's a there's a graph there. So the things that 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 really empower people, right? If you're if if you are doing something because you're you feel like you're part of a bigger picture, you're growing, you're 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 leveling up, and you're using your creativity, it feels very very good. Now the bottom ones, I call them the black hat gamification techniques, and they're very very powerful in bottom line activity, like. But if, you, if you're always doing something because you want to avoid a loss, because you can't have something or you don't know what's going to happen next, again, it's, very, it's tremendously awesome in, in getting you to do something, but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So if when you... Which one is the black hat? The black hats are, are the, black the, hat the bottom three are the black hat ones. The top three are the white Scarcity hat ones. Scarcity, avoidance, and... Unpredictability. Scarcity, avoidance, and unpredictability. Yes. And the ones in the so middle that's... can be white or black, depending right. on how you do it. Okay, so so not to not to spiral this. I know there's like lots of detailed questions. I'm <laughs> yes. sure other people have. I you know this is something that I've always thought about. So you know when you say something like black hat, white hat goes either way. Things can be good, but then they have a dark side. You know it's sort of it creates a little bit of a um, a sort of a cognitive dissonance for us because for example scarcity isn't an inherently negative thing. Scarcity is a thing that actually exists, right? And you've even, you've even put like in scarcity, you know, something like appointment dynamics. Mm -hmm. I mean, people do have to be reminded and make appointments. Can you explain for us a little bit more what you mean by white hat, black hat? What's, what's negative so, and what's so, positive? So again, so again, white hat is things that empower you, right? It makes you feel good about yourself. You're in full control. Now, black hat are things that you will, we will do, but it to a strong degree you feel like you're not in control so like a point of a dynamic you just said you have to you have to be there at that time right so if everything you're doing is because you have to then you don't like it it's right it exists in the in right now but just because it exists could also mean it's positive or negative now the problem like for instance with zynga right is that it really mastered all these black hat techniques that's that's amazing in driving activity right but because again it leaves a black, bad taste in your mouth sometimes Without, if you don't balance it with the white hat stuff, users give Zynga great numbers and then they leave when they can, right? Because they feel like they're not in control of their of their actions as in the long run. So it's like you know, it's right. like gambling, right? You gamble, you're stuck to it, but once you can withdraw, you withdraw. Now, just because it's black hat doesn't mean it's necessarily bad, because you know a lot of people voluntarily put themselves in black hat gamification in order to like go to the gym more often, eat healthily. You know, the, I, I like to talk about the alarm clock app that whenever you press the snooze button, it takes a dollar away from your account, right? And this is, this is waking up because of loss and avoidance, right? You don't want to lose money, and that's why you wake up. So if you, if you say, I want to use Black Hat Gamification to, do, to create an, an action that I want for myself, that's okay. What people don't like is companies doing that to them um, to benefit the companies but not the user. So, so I wouldn't say using Black Hat gamification techniques is necessarily bad, but you always want to, if you want long-term engagement, you don't want people to drop out. You want to balance it out with the White Hat. 
So, um, so there's a question from uh, Loki or Loki. Thanks so much uh, for the question, which is about whether or not these core drives are similar to intrinsic motivation. And and Loki references Rajat Paharia, um, who's mm -hmm. awesome, and as many of you know, founder of uh, Bunchball, um, and has a great book uh, called Loki 3.0. But just in general, can you talk about how these drives in octalysis, these emotional states mm -hmm. that you talk about, how are they connected to questions of yeah. motivation? So, so at the very beginning, I initially thought thought, all right, so all of them are core drives, so they're all based on intrin like intrinsically driven, but they can extend to extrinsic. But I, but I studied this a little bit more, and I felt, hey, I saw a pattern where I, th I think the left brain core drives are actually more of the extrinsic motivations, right? Ownership and possession, you're acquiring something. That's very extrinsic, right? Scarcity, you want something because you can have it. Accomplishment, depending on if it's on the mastery side or just leveling up side. But on the right side, those are more uh, intrinsic, right? Using your creativity, that's fun. Hang out with your friends, that's intrinsic, right? So, so I think there's, so it's interesting because if, if, you say, if you think about it that way, the top is white, bottom is black, left is extrinsic, left, right is intrinsic, then core drive number three, which is empowerment, or creativity, and feedback, is the golden place where it's intrinsic and white hat. And this is where a lot of games or systems have uh, become evergreen content, right? When you're constantly using your creativity, solving new problems, figuring things out, that's something when people feel they don't need to be rewarded for it and they feel empowered and they feel good about it. So, so that's actually something really interesting. Um, applying this to, to other models, right? We also have the, the, uh, the purpose, the mastery, autonomy, and, so, and uh, relatedness, right? So that, that is all correct, and, but that, as you can you probably know from this framework, it focuses on the white hat stuff, right? Purpose is meaning, mastery is development accomplishment, autonomy is empowerment, and relatedness is obviously social influence. So that is a very good model, but it doesn't explain why people are addicted to gambling, right? Because gambling doesn't have any of that. Maybe it's a little bit of a, an autonomy, right? And so, so I think the framework is useful, at least for myself and for, for uh, a decent amount of others, is that it allows you to see a big picture of motivation. I actually think that everything you do is driven by one of these eight core drives, and there's actually a hidden ninth core drive, but we don't have to go there. What's uh, the, wait, what's the hidden ninth one? I mean, that, you okay. can't just leave that out. And leave <laughs> right. us there's just a lot of content to cover. The ninth core drive is sensation, right? Feeling good. So, so I cannot create a website that gives you the sensation of being on a roller coaster. Right, and this is why, for instance, like porn sites, they probably don't need any of these core drives. Um, so, and and games do accomplish a lot of sensation through stronger, better graphics, right? But most gamification campaigns don't really uh, need or use these strong, these powerful graphics. So, so that's why it's the ninth core drive. It's there, but but usually for most gamification uh, implementations, you know, it's it's these eight core drives. What, you know, one thing that jumps out right away as soon as you look at this framework, which is, you know, clearly well thought out, and I want to talk a little bit about it in a little bit more detail, but um, what is Destiny Child? Destiny Child... Other than a band that featured Beyonce. <laughs> Destiny mm -hmm. Child is making users feel like they're destined to, to do something, right? So in a game, and this, we, this you, you've probably seen in literature, you're just not framed, uh, phrased that way, is in a game... There's always this big, some big thing that's going to happen in the world. The world's getting destroyed, and somehow you are the only person qualified to save the world. So you're des so you have to save the world, destined to it. Now, another another example is just that, you know, let's say so. In, in if you're using a product, and somehow through the language, through the context, it makes you feel like, hey, for me to be who I am, I have to, I I have to do this, right? It's it's not it's not. I, it's not because I can gain something, but it's because I'm uniquely positioned to do this, right? When you make people think, think that they're uniquely positioned to do this, they have a, they have a much higher chance to, to, to join or to do something. Do you think that, um, so, so given kind of your background, the Octalysis, like, does it come out of, you know, you as a gamer, because you, you talk a lot about game concepts, you put a lot of things through your game frame, you're, uh, you know, well known as being, uh, having been at least at one point a, a hardcore, very successful gamer. What about the other influences on the question of design and gamification? Do those matter, or do you think that the game reference point for Noctos is sufficient to explain and, and help us design anything we might need? Yeah, so so gamification is something very interesting, right? It's actually, a, it's it's a combination of obviously game design, game dynamics, but also, you know, behavioral economics, you know, mo motivational psychology, 
Um, it's also about technology application, as well as a few more, right? And also business applications to, to drive an ROI. So games, interestingly, have all of them besides the business application drive an ROI, right? So, so usually, if you look into games, you can learn a ton that can be applied to business. So the only thing the gamification uh, expert, I think, has to know is, first of all, all the other stuff from games, and then the second part is how to apply it into business applications. And the reason why I think it's so useful learning from games is because I think gamification is, is actually what I call human-focused design uh, as, po as opposed to function-focused design. So it's something that optimizes not for output or efficiency, but by the human motivation, you know. So the reason why we call it um, Gamification is because I think games have spent decades or centuries, depending on what you, what you count as a game, to master human-focused design because there's, there's really no purpose to the game besides entertaining the human inside. Even if they have a purpose like saving the world, that's like an excuse, right, to, just to entertain. So because games have mastered all of that, just that, now we're learning from games. We're saying, oh, there's a lot of other things in life that are useful, but it really doesn't think about why a person wants to do it. Like, Startups come to me all the time and say, hey, look, users can do this, users can do, users can do this. It's awesome. And I said, well, but you haven't told me why they would want to use it, right? It's really not focused on their, their emotional state, what their motivation. And that's why you see a lot of companies out there that with great products and technology, but no one's using it because there's no, no motivation there. Well, here's the here's a sort of question, though, right? So then, t I mean, in your from your perspective, I've talked about this a lot. I've asked other guests th this question often. So you've got these game designers who are really good at telling engaging stories that, in your words, are you know for pure engagement, they don't serve another purpose. Then you've got these game designers doing mostly what we call um, you know something like serious games or games for good or news games or games for social change. Why do they make such unbelievable crap? I think it's because, you mean the, for the serious games to develop? Oh, well, that whole category. So uh, <laughs> what, why is that whole category such a landmine of terrible stuff if that discipline is so incredibly good at connecting with people in a way that's meaningful and engaging? What's the gap uh, it, in, there's your, a, in your thinking? A lot of times the game developers still, like, it's, it's in, in, in every industry, right? There's people who really know what they're doing, the people who don't. The, night, the, the appeal about games is a lot of people want to create games because they grew up playing them, and it's fun, right? Fun to create games. Um, so they go into the industry, and they don't really understand. What, what they do is like what I call they copy the shell of, of a game design. So they would say, hey, these guys are doing this. Let me copy that, but let me make some tweaks. And then you realize you see the same thing. You see the, you see the design, you see the graphics, but you don't see the, the motivational pull. So like if someone comes to me and say, hey, Yuka, we're making a game. It's like a ninja running around killing monsters. Is that fun or not? It's like, well, I don't know, right? It depends on how you design it, right? And so, and so they, a lot of times, and ironically, this is why when, when the game developer is copying another game to the teeth, right? Even though they don't understand why it's motivational, why it's motivating, they just copy it to the teeth. They just switch out the graphic instead of a dog as a kangaroo. And then, and then it becomes a huge hit. They spend more marketing dollars pushing it. And they add a little bit more viral, uh, viral effects to it, and they become a huge success. So that's on the game front. On the serious gaming front, I think it's a little bit worse because a lot of people in serious games aren't well-trained game developers to begin with. They start off saying, I want to make a difference. Now let me do something game-like. And again, they don't understand the core of a game. Um, and I wrote a I wrote a, a article before talking about how, and it's based on someone else's work, but it's but it's how Skyrim's opening is very similar to Modern Warfare's opening. It's all you're tied up on a jeep or on a, on a on a on a vehicle, and you can move your head around. That's all, right? But Modern Warfare captures the essence of it. It shows you the context, the excitement of the world, why you should explore. Whereas uh, Skyrim being an amazing game right after that shows you some a very boring part of it. It's just you don't see the amazing world you can explore and all that stuff. So that's that's something that I that I talk a lot about, which is the, co copying the essence versus the the real the real core of an experience. Well, I, I think that's interesting, and I I think that in some ways makes a lot of sense coming from your perspective. But it doesn't, it, to me, it feels like half an answer or mm -hmm. answers half the problem, right? And I think this is something that Rajat was talking about here on the show a few weeks ago, Rajat, Rajat Paharia, which is that there is some fundamental flaw in game design that's about how to drive motivation and behavior. That's why games in general actually haven't been that good at really long-term 
behavior change. That's why games in general actually are still a kind of art form, right, that mostly fails, which you uh, sort of said yourself. Where does your, in your world, because I know that the octalysis is not purely about games, where do you kind of, where do you sort of see the continuum? How deeply do you think a gamification designer actually has to understand games in order to be successful at what they do? I think it's, and that's like Sasha I said, I don't, asked a similar question. I don't think it's, it's like 100 people required. Like I said, if you understand a little bit of game design, but you also understand psychological motivation, economics, behavior, creating economy, point system, all that stuff, right? You, you understand all of that. Then you can be fine also. It's just games already have it readily packaged there. You see data, you see what games are appealing, what games are not. Um, and, and therefore, you, it's, I think it's just a much faster way to learn as opposed to learning from scratch. And I would, I would disagree with, with your comment, uh, respectfully, uh, about the games, the, the long-lastingness of, of games. Because like I said, most games, again, it's three to eight months. You play it, and then you, you move to a new game. And I think Gabe is disconnected, but everyone else might still be on. So anyway, um, so like what, what we just showed here is level one octalysis. Right, there's five levels to it, which uh, which gets more and more complex. The level two really factors in the four experience phases. Most games don't think about the end game, right? And 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 even worse for gamification applications, right? The end game again is why do people stay on after they've done everything? How do you retain the veterans? Because your veterans are your best, you know, moderators, evangelists, monetization vehicles. That that I just that I just cut out from everyone, or just I got I lost you. No, we got you. All right, because I've been talking times. So I don't know if I should repeat. Anyway, um, no. all right. So, so some games, right? Like I said, StarCraft, StarCraft, right? StarCraft One, when when Star, it came out in what 1998. When StarCraft Two came out, um, everyone was play, still playing StarCraft One. Like 10, 15 years after, there's a national sport on StarCraft, right? And so this is a game that designed its end game very well. Now, unfortunately, most games don't design their end games very well, or they use too much black hat, white hat, and the end game, and which translates to most products and uh, marketing campaigns. They don't really think about the end game. Everyone focuses on, hey, how do I get? I think my game's awesome, so I'm focusing on the onboarding. As users don't, just don't understand my game. I need to get to see my game, and that's about it. They don't really think about how to retain your veterans. And if you design your end game well, if if in the end game you you actually appeal to all eight of those core drives, right? Then you have amazing long lasting uh, engagement. And I don't think that's that's what you know people would just drop out. So a lot of games do that. It's just it's just whether you know how to design it correctly or not. Okay, so quick question for you. I guess you know, just we're um, getting to the end of our session here. So. If you had to give really tangible advice to somebody looking to gamify, let's say a startup, mm -hmm. okay, but we uh, a, a software product, yeah. a, a mobile app, or a website or something, if you had to give them really super tangible advice about how to get started and what they need to do right out of the gate, what, what do you normally tell people who come to you looking for advice? I would, I would, product? I would say two things, which is what I kind of covered earlier. One is do do study games, play games, right? Don't don't just like understand but play. Know what it feels like to be really addicted to a game where, you know, you want to wake up 3 a.m. in the morning behind your parents back when you're little to play, to grind or, you know, you're always thinking but you don't want to sleep. Really understand understand what it feels to be in that state and understand how it does that. And so the second part is I give every gamification designer is really focus more on the, the, the user's feeling, how users feel the core drive instead of the game mechanics. You don't, you don't start off asking, okay, where do we put the points or where do we put the badges? We, you start off asking, how can I make my users feel accomplished, right? And then maybe badges are the thing, maybe not. Maybe, maybe if you give them a badge when they just log in, they don't feel accomplished. They feel like, what, what is this, right? But if they've done something amazing, you give them a badge, then they feel accomplished, right? So you always start off asking, how do I make my users feel instead of where do I put these game mechanics? So one quick question, I think that's great. One quick question actually from Amy uh, Baskin, who uh, you might recall was a speaker at G Summit and, and frequent watcher of the show, is so if the game is, if a gamified experience is good at changing people's behavior while they're playing, but it doesn't last, that behavior change doesn't last after they're done playing, what did the designer do wrong? And let me rephrase that for you. 
should we expect that the things that we design as gamification designers, um, should we expect that that should be something that people use for the rest of their lives, or should we it, design things with finite It time? depends on what you're doing, your goal, right? Like when I work with a client, the first, I always make them define five things at the beginning, and the first thing is the business metric. What, how do you measure success, right? It can't be something fluffy like, oh, people are happier. It's really quantifiable. And so, and that leads to objective of the game. If the, if the objective of the game is for everyone to do this activity and then leave, then that's fine. Then you've succeeded. Now, some, some games, some people, their goal is to keep people on for as long as possible, which is like many games too. And therefore, you want to design that way. So it's not, so there's no problem if you want people, if the game's ended and there's no more engagement, right? That's, that's by design. But it's just, my key thing is you want to, you want to, it has to be intentful. It has to be by design, not by accident. I, I think that's great. And I really want to thank you, uh, Yukai Chow, for coming on online with us today, joining us on the Gamification Revolution. Folks can follow you on Twitter or check out octalysis.com. The URL is down there, O-C-T-A-L-Y-S-I-S.com, to look at that amazing model that you built, find out more, keep in touch with you. Thanks so much, Yukai. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, thank you. For everybody else who's been with us, remember to join us around the world this fall and winter. Come join me at one of the G Summit global events coming to a town near you. It's gsummit.com. In the meantime, um, you can also follow me on Twitter. It's at gzakurm or read more about gamification, gamification.co. For everyone who's been online with us today on this special Wednesday edition of the Gamification Revolution, thanks for being here. Look forward to seeing you all next week at another episode. In the meantime, everyone, keep having fun. See ya. See ya.